So thanks a lot for have, uh, accepting my paper to, to the conference. Uh, my name is Hugues Dastarac, I'm an economist from Banque de France, and I'm uh, going to talk to you about uh, strategic trading, welfare and prices with futures contracts. Uh, as I'm working in a central bank, uh, the usual uh, disclaimer applies, these are my views. Um, so uh, the motivation for this paper, we are basically we all know what forward and future contracts are. Uh, these are derivatives uh, written on a commodity, a currency, a bond or stock, uh, by which uh, traders agree today on a price and a quantity to trade in the future. Uh, and this allows them to hedge against uh, future price movements. Uh, the classical justification for trading these contracts is that trading today is impossible. Uh, if you think about the commodity pro producer, for example, uh, uh, he wants to hedge uh, the price, uh, the, the risk regarding uh, a future price, uh, the price at which it, uh, he or she will sell its future production. If uh, this commodity producer were able to, to sell uh, immediately, he would do it because trading today is a perfect hedge uh, for future price risk. Uh, but as uh, maybe the oil is, is under the ground or for an agricultural uh, commodity producer, uh, the crops have not uh, yet grown up. Uh, they resort to, 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 to futures uh, trading. So basically, this classical justification is that futures allows traders to overcome physical or borrowing constraints. Now, the broad question I ask in this paper is, do this uh, trading constraint explain all futures trading? Uh, if you look, for instance, as, at uh, the U.S. Treasury market, it's a highly liquid market in which financing constraints are plausibly very light. Uh, it's easy to short a treasury bond. And if I don't have uh, uh, the money right now to buy a treasury bond, uh, uh, but I know that at a, I will have it uh, later in the future, uh, I can still borrow right now, put uh, the bond as a collateral, uh, and buy the bond right now. Um, but still, uh, since uh, over the last five years, uh, we have seen that between one and two trillions of futures uh, were uh, traded and written on treasury bonds. So my claim is that we likely need another story for at least for this case. And if this story works for the US treasury market, maybe it works also for other asset classes. So in this paper, uh, what I do is that I provide you with a I provide a story uh, that do not does not rely on trading constraints uh, to explain uh, why futures are traded, and this story is based only on imperfect competition. So this is the first research question I ask, and then I investigate the consequences of imperfect competition. I see uh, on futures trading, and I have I have basically three main results. Uh, the first one is that. Uh, imperfect competition uh, uh, creates gains from trading futures, uh, from trading, sorry, future price risk with futures contracts. Uh, so we expect that if these futures are introduced, uh, in this case, uh, traders' welfare would be, uh, will, would be raised uh, because there is more risk sharing. Uh, but still, when we introduce futures, in fact, traders' welfare decreases uh, and this because when they are introduced, uh, trader, when futures are introduced, traders also want to manipulate this, uh, their payoff. And this motive uh, dominates uh, futures trading. And uh, if, future, if manipulation uh, were, pre uh, was, were precluded, um, futures would increase welfare. Uh, the, th the third the main result I have is that uh, futures uh, trade at a price that can be either above or below the spot price, uh, and this with or without manipulation. And this is not explained by classical uh, thing like uh, storage costs or interest rates. Um, and I show that, in fact, traders in my model are better off by trading against the future spot spread, meaning that uh, they are better off if they buy expensive and sell cheap. And so overall, what I show in this setting is that 
we ha I have an arbitrage opportunity that emerges that, that, that is left in equilibrium and this without market segmentation. Uh, I find it surprising. I will skip the literature review for the interest of time and jump to the setting. Uh, so I have three dates, uh, zero, one, and two indexed by T, uh, and one risky asset that pays off uh, random payoff uh, V at T equal two, and it's normally distributed. As I promised, uh, there are no financing or short selling or physical trading constraints. There are no storage costs. Uh, the interest rate is normalized to zero. And trading occurs at date zero and one in a centralized market. So everything is pretty simple and standard. Uh, trading occurs at prices P0 and P1. And I have a number N of risk averse traders um, that are split between uh, B buyers and S, a number B of buyers and a number S of sellers. Uh, and this number has to be. Uh, greater than three just for technical requirements. Uh, this is, allows me to, 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 to look for equilibria in linear strategies. Uh, equilibrium where with uh, two traders uh, also exists, but not in, uh, in linear strategies. Uh, and the sellers are just uh, those that, high with a high, uh, that start with a high endowment of the assets. Finally, all information is symmetric. So the only friction uh, which is really key to, 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 to the results, is the, the first one here. Um, this is imperfect competition. More specifically, this means that uh, traders man manage the price impact of their trades. Um, so uh, this leads them to, to restrict the quantity they trade in equilibrium, basically. Uh, the second key ingredient is that at t equal one, uh, there is a supply shock Q. Uh, that from a model uh, from, from traders that I do not model. Uh, this queue uh, viewed from date zero is normally distributed again. And for the signing convention, it's positive if and only if traders' inventory increases. So these customers sell, queue is positive. And uh, as we would expect, at date, uh, this makes the date one price uh, decrease when customers sell and queue is positive. And the converse hold uh, if queue is negative. Um, and the third uh, non standard ingredient I had, which is, which is the core of the paper, is that I allow uh, traders to, to trade futures or forward contracts. Uh, these are traded at t equals zero. They pay off the difference between uh, the date one price, the date one spot price, and uh, this F0, which is the futures price. Uh, and the payoff occurs at date t equals one. This future price, futures price is, uh, is determined in equilibrium uh, at day zero. Uh, these futures or forwards are in zero net supply, so really they appear endogenously in this model. Uh, obviously, I can, uh, I can allow them to, to, to arise in non-zero net supply. It uh, doesn't change many things. Uh, last remark, I'm talking about futures and forwards. Uh, in this paper, I make no difference between the two in particular. Uh, if you expect futures uh, to be uh, to, to be subject to margin requirements, uh, I do not model them in this model. Uh, finally, for the equilibrium concepts, I'm looking for Nash equilibrium uh, or Nash equilibrium in demand schedules, um, in uh, especially uh, equilibria in linear strategies. I don't know if there are other equilibria in nonlinear strategies, but this is a classical open question in the literature. Um, and I'm also adding the trend, uh, trending enhanceability uh, requirements uh, in order to address an equilibrium multiplicity pro uh, problem and borrowing techniques from a classical paper in the, in the literature. Uh, so now I will uh, sketch the three main results I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, and the first one corresponds to the situation in which uh, futures are not traded. So I show that. Uh, with imperfect competition in the equilibrium without, without futures, imperfect competition creates gains from trading risk on P1, on the prior date one price. Uh, why that's so? Uh, it's really classical results uh, that um, in order to mitigate the price impact of trades uh, on uh, both P0 and P1, uh, sellers want to slice their orders into smaller pieces 
the first one to be traded at day zero, and the second one to be traded at day one. This is exactly symmetric for buyers who want to defer part of the purchases until day one. And so only a fraction of gains from trade are realized for date, uh, at uh, t equals zero. So at date one, sellers will continue to sell and buyers will continue to buy. But by doing, uh, by doing this, uh, buyers and sellers also are also exposed to a risk on the, tr the price at which, uh, the, at which they will trade at the price P1. This because in particular of the supply shock. Uh, again, uh, when these unmobile traders uh, sell, P1 goes down. If they buy, the price uh, goes up. Um, and uh, it happens that uh, quite intuitively, sellers will fear a low price P1 because they will uh, sell at, uh, they are more ha happier if they sell at high price and buyers fear a high price P1. So they have opposite exposure to, uh, to this risk and they, are, they, they have gains from trading a contract that uh, allows this and precisely what uh, such a contract, uh, such a risk sharing can be implemented with futures. In this case, sellers, if they traded futures for hedging purposes, would sell futures and get the payoff F0, the futures price, minus uh, the date one price. And so if when the, um, the, the date one price is low, uh, which is what they fear, the payoff of the future is high. So futures allow them to, to smooth their profits. And this is symmetric, buyers would buy futures. Um, just for the quick remark for the perfect competition benchmark, as all gains from trade are realized at the t equals zero because the traders do not get our uh, price takers, uh, there are no gains from trading futures. Now, second results. Uh, what happens when I actually introduce futures? Um, basically, your futures, uh, as they pay off uh, the, the difference P1 minus F0, um, they give a new motive to impact P1. So traders care about, care about the price impact of their trade. And in particular, they care about the impact of their trade on date P1 and ultimately on the futures payoff. And so futures buyer or long futures would like to raise P1 in order to raise their payoff. Uh, short futures or future sellers have the opposite payoff. And so they want to, um, to decrease P1. Uh, in other words, uh, traders want to manipulate uh, the futures payoff. And so you have two motives for trading futures. One is risk sharing or hedging. And the second one is trying to manipulate uh, the futures payoff. I show that in equilibrium, free futures are traded only in order to manipulate payoff uh, because the incentives to manipulate overwhelm the incentive to, to, to hedge. So what happens more precisely? Sellers of the underlying assets will sell more aggressively and buy futures uh, to the buyers of the assets. So this is exactly the opposite uh, to what they would do if they were to trade uh, futures for trading purposes. Um, one also striking uh, result is that as the quantity of uh, the quantity of future traded decreases. Uh, when the volatility of P1 increases and it even shrinks to zero as this volatility becomes infinite. So this means that when traders have face more risk, they have more hedging needs, re needs for, uh, sorry, and there are less futures that are traded. So this also illustrates the fact that uh, uh, traders do not trade uh, futures for hedging purposes. So we might, uh, if uh, futures are not traded uh, in a way that, share, uh, that allows them to share risk, uh, we might expect that uh, futures uh, do, not, uh, does not, uh, do not increase welfare. And this is precisely what happened, uh, which seems uh, pretty surprising. In fact, more precisely, uh, there are two opposite effects of uh, introducing futures on welfare. Uh, the first one, um, which I briefly mentioned uh, is positive and it's that uh, traders trade the underlying asset more aggressively. Um, and there are some cases in which in fact, they trade exactly the competitive quantity. So this is a positive effect uh, because uh, you don't have these inefficiencies uh, that you carry from date one to day zero to date one. But there is also a negative effect I, I have alluded to 
uh, futures position are opposite to that uh, uh, to to that that uh, to to to, uh, to hedging position. Sorry. Um, so traders choose to face higher risk. And overall, I show that the negative effect of uh, introducing future dominates. Oh, sorry. Um, so we may ask why, in particular, uh, is it because of manipulation or other things? And in order to answer this question, I study a theoretical futures in which I shut down uh, the manipulation, um, uh, the manipulation incentives. Unfortunately, I do know I don't know how to implement them, but uh, they are useful uh, theoretical benchmark at least. And I show that. Uh, Contrary to uh, real futures or uh, to concrete futures in the in this setting, uh, with this abstract contract, trading is slower than without futures instead of being uh, uh, quicker, and futures position allow to share uh, to actually share risk. And overall, uh, the welfare increases with futures. So really, it's about uh, if futures decrease welfare, it's because of manipulation. And now the third main result, uh, it regards uh, asset prices and an equilibrium uh, futures, an equilibrium spread between futures and spot, uh, which arises only because of imperfect competition and thus not uh, without market segmentation. So not because some traders are precluded to um, not to trade, uh, to precluded to trade in one market or the other. Um, so the, ba uh, the shape of this basis, this spread between the futures price and the spot price, is that is the following. Uh, this is a pro uh, the, the, this spread is proportional to the day zero expectation of the supply shock queue. Um, first, uh, it's really related to imperfect competition. If you look at the second bullet point, uh, this constant k uh, shrinks to zero in the perfect competition benchmark. Uh, so the spread uh, shrinks to zero uh, with perfect competition. Um, now the direction of the spread, uh, futures, the futures price is above the, the spot, so all this is uh, positive, if and only if uh, this expectation is negative. There is a minus here. And so uh, the futures price is above the spot price, if and only if uh, the date one price is expected to be high. Uh, third descriptive fact, this spread does not stem from manipulation because it also arises uh, because uh, with uh, my non-manipulable uh, futures. And uh, they ha it has exactly the, the, same, uh, the same shape. So why uh, this future spot spread? Um, well, uh, futures uh, and uh, spot prices are both sensitive to this day zero expectation of a supply shock but for different reasons. So they express uh, marginal values of futures and as a uh, futures contract and uh, underlying asset, uh, but the, these marginal values are different. The spot price first, consider, consider for the, this price. If traders um, expect a high P1 because uh, uh, these uh, unmodeled customers are expected to buy, so this expectation is negative. Uh, in order, uh, yeah, they, um, they would like to, to benefit from this uh, by buying at day zero, at a low price P0, and to resell in order to resell to these customers at a high price P, P1. It's a kind of intertemporal arbitrage, if you want. Um, and so, as all traders would like to do so, they all do this. Uh, they all raise their, their demand curves. And uh, as a result, the, the date one price increase. Uh, sorry, uh, the date zero price. There is a typo here. Increases. Um, regarding the futures price, um, it goes through another ch channel. Uh, it's not because uh, of this intact or temporal uh, arbitrage argument. It's simply the, because traders are um, sensitive to the expected uh, payoff of the futures which is um, the expectation of the date one price minus the futures price. It happened that in traders wealth, um, the coefficients in front of these two of the, of the two corresponding terms are different. Uh, and this leads to different sensitivities of the spot price and the futures price to the expectation 
of uh, the day zero expectation of the supply shock. And it happens that the sensitivities converge in the perfect competition limits, uh, so the spread goes to zero. Now, third question, uh, why is the spread not arbitraged away by traders? Um, and in order to answer this question, uh, just have a look, it's very really simple to, 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 to infer what arbitrageurs would do. They would buy spot and sell futures if the spot is uh, cheaper than the futures. So they buy uh, cheap and they sell expensive. They would do the converse, buy futures and sell spots if the futures price is below the, date, uh, the, the spot price. Uh, but in fact, I show that traders in this model are better off by doing exactly the opposite. So spot sellers in particular are better off with respect to spot buyers if uh, the, the futures price is more above or higher, uh, more generally, than this uh, with respect to the spot price. Uh, and precisely what uh, these spot sellers do is that they, they sell spot in equilibrium and buy futures. So they sell cheap and they buy expensive. So they trade exactly against the basis. And why this? <coughs> uh, this is because um, when the futures price is higher than the spot price, because um, uh, because uh, the, sorry, when uh, the day zero expectation of the supply shock increases, uh, the futures price increases with respect to the spot price, um, and this implies that uh, the date one price P one is expected to be higher. Uh, with respect to uh, 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 is expected to be higher. Uh, this also leads uh, the date zero spot price to be uh, to be to to be raised as well, and so uh, the overall spot terms of trade are more in favor of sellers. Basically, sellers will sell at a higher price, and buyers will buy at a higher price, which they dislike. This is the first effect. And you might say, okay, but uh, there is uh, an effect of a, of a futures payoff, but it turns out that traders are insensitive to the expected futures, uh, the, the expected payoff of futures, expectation uh, of P1 minus the futures price in, in equilibrium. This is because any increase related to uh, expectation of Q, um, in, in increase in, uh, in the date one expect, uh, expected price, uh, that stems from a, um, a decrease in uh, the date zero expectation of, uh, of Q, is reflected one for one in futures price. So uh, basically, uh, traders, uh, sorry, are insensitive to, uh, to variation uh, of the expectation of Q on uh, the, the expected. Uh, uh, futures payoff. So this explains why, in fact, um, traders leave some arbitrage opportunity on the table. They, they, they trade against what arbitrageurs would do. Uh, so this raises an important question that I leave for future research. What if we introduce arbitrageur? Does it increase overall welfare? I don't know. Uh, we usually think of arbitrage raising welfare because it connects uh, people who, who cannot trade with each other. Here, the story might be different. So the conclusion, um, I give a model of forward or futures uh, contract trading based only on imperfect competition and not of trading const uh, constraints, which is, uh, to my knowledge, new. Uh, I showed first that in fact, imperfect competition uh, by introducing incentives to delay trades uh, creates gains from sharing risk on P1 with futures. But in equilibrium, uh, futures are not traded for risk sharing, but for manipulation. And all traders end up being worse off with futures, this only because of manipulation. They also leave an arbitrage opportunity on the table uh, in the form of future spot spread. And this without uh, market segmentation or without trading constraints again. And in fact, uh, the, the incentive of traders are not to be uh, arbitrageurs, and they are better off uh, by trading against the future spot spread. 
Uh, and now there are some avenues for future future research, uh, but uh, these are maybe for, for future papers. Uh, how to prevent future manipulation? Are there, is there room for derivatives with non-linear pair of or that are like options? And uh, maybe it would also be interesting to to see what happens with more trading periods and uh, to, to get in order to get a term structure structure of, uh, of futures. So thanks a lot. So thank you very much for having me here to discuss this very interesting paper. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the, uh, a few comments. And uh, since the, uh, the presenter has done a great job of uh, presenting the results. So the big, big research questions uh, are the, uh, the following. So why traders want to trade the futures? Uh, so when there are no kind of constraints in the spot market. So this paper provides a very kind of unique uh, perspective. Uh, meaning that the um, investors are very big, so they have a price impact. And so the futures uh, market can provide a rule to complete the, the, the market. So that, that's kind of very uh, unique rule and or perspective of thinking about the future of the market, which is very different from the literature. And then the paper studies some uh, normative and positive implications of adding future to market. The normative, um, many of them are very surprising. For example, there's normative implications. If you have uh, a futures market, that actually that can make everyone worse off. Uh, so that's kind of counterintuitive because initially, might you think if you have a um, uh, more complete market, then that fair, higher for risk sharing that can improve welfare, which is not the case here. Also, the paper studied some positive implications uh, so for, for trading and for pricing and for trading and what will be the incentive for uh, future traders to manipulate the price and also the, uh, what can be the difference between futures and spot price uh, so that's the, the basis uh, so the author called this as a arbitrage opportunity and uh, so I think it's basically just the basis uh, so th th this is what the paper asks so the, the setup is very, very parsimonious. So there are three days, two trading periods. Data zero and data one, people will trade there. And the buying risk is especially on the line. You can think about the on the line as, a, as an equity or as a, as a bond or, or commodity, anything is on the line. It has three elements. The first one is a constant, then has two additional elements, epsilon one and epsilon two. Both of them normally distributed with some as a zero mean and some variance. And then you have exponential investors. So those investors have a common risk averting coefficient of gamma, and all of them are bigger players, meaning that they have a price impact. So you have a fine number of players. You have a B buyers and, and S sellers. Uh, so the numbers are finite. Then two shocks on data one. So the first one is a payoff shock, fund fundamental news, which is the epsilon one that will be revealed as a public information. So epsilon one has a mean zero and some variance sigma x to sigma one. And then also additional supply shock, which is, you think about it as a noise traders in the, in the IE models, but the supply shock also have at random. And traders, they, they will assign the demand schedules uh, and the price will be determined by market clear condition. Then the paper considers the setting, uh, two settings. So in one setting, there's no future market. In the second setting, there is a future traded on data zero and the payoff on data one. The payoff will, will be the price uh, equilibrium price uh, on data one, the equilibrium of uh, the price of the underlying asset. So the, 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 this kind of two settings to compare the rule of adding uh, future to market. I think that's a very informative equation in the paper. Uh, so uh, the author did not present that equation. I think that equation is very, very informative. So remember that, that the payoff on future on data, uh, on data one is the equilibrium price, uh, the spot price, which is endogenous. So it has a, a four element. The first element is a constant, that is the average payoff. And then you have a two random shocks. Uh, so one is epsilon one, the other one is the Q. Q. Epsilon one is the fundamental news. Q is the supply shock. Uh, and then you have some factor here that will capture the, the, the price impact. So the, the, comp, the, kind of the imperfect competition. And this is two elements will imply, so because it's epsilon one and the key will run them, it will imply that the future can have some hedging motivation, some hedging benefit. So this is, this is the kind of sort of the benefit. But in addition to that, another endogenous element, this, this one uh, is uh, the, the average uh, inventory. So the gamma is risk of variance, sigma two is the variance of epsilon two, epsilon two which is residual uncertainty. So this I1 bar is the average inventory. So this every inventory, the expectation on this actually will create some manipulation motivation for, for, for traders. 
So they, these are the kind of the two things. This, this one is a hedging. Uh, uh, this, uh, the first one will be manipulation. I think this equation is very, very informative in the paper. And then the paper presents the kind of uh, three main results. I kind of uh, write them as a form. I, I think it is a one more result, which is more interesting. So first of all, <clears throat> the, the imperfect competition will create some market incompleteness uh, through the price impact mitigation because each investor is big. They want to, it's like a car model. They want to slow down the price impact. They trade it slowly, and it's, but that will create some risk in the next period. So this is done by showing in a setting with the outer future market that creates some trading motive. Introducing that uh, future market is, is beneficial. But I, I think this is also very surprising to me. And the, in, if you have a future the, a contract, actually traders will, uh, uh, oh, sorry, the, 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 uh, the third one. So, so here, it, the, they want to manipulate the future the payoff because of the better inventory. And I will comment a little bit here about the manipulation. This is, I know this is very common in the in the game theory, uh, but in the, in the writing of the paper, it's more linked to the regulation implication. So I, I think that the, the, the manipulation word in the game theory is very sort of different from probably what the regulators think about in, in, in practice. Uh, so I, I think the third result is kind of very, very interesting, uh, very surprising. So you, adding a future to the market, actually everyone can become a worse off because of this manipulation uh, you say, uh, actually in the, second, in, the, in the second political point. And this welfare implication, I think it is kind of very surprising. Mm, it probably can, can be highlighted more. And the last one, the support price can be different from the future price. And also, so this is kind of arbitrary opportunity. Uh, so, so I have some kind of uh, reservation on this terminology again. So this is probably not, a, because this is equilibrium model, you don't have arbitrage. And it's probably some hypothetical setting in which if you, uh, you, you people are competitive measures, you, that, that might be arbitrage. So that, that, this is kind of the, the summary of the result. Given I probably, I only have 12 minutes. I'm going to, I have some comments. The first one, it's about the interpretation and the robustness. Uh, the interpretation, uh, as I said, the kind of one key result, I think the very, very interesting is if you add futures that will not affect the price, but can reduce the welfare of every investor. So when I think about this, I, I think the whether this result is a benchmark, is a norm, or it's just something to kind of very specific to the setting. Either case is okay, just about the interpretation. If it's specific to the setting, it can, you can think about what it, uh, assumption they can add, they can make the result that um, closer to reality. Or alternatively, if you think this is what's happening in reality, probably you can also try to highlight this to, to connect this to, 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 to the empirical regularities. So I think the paper now has a lot of um, abstractions. First of all, is that you have homogeneous risk of uh, And uh, if you allow homogeneous risk of worrying, I'm not sure whether the result will be robust. And another one is, um, I think this is probably beyond the model, but it's again about the interpretation. You, it's, uh, you see the, 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 the paper set a stage by seeing that uh, normally people don't want to treat the future because you, you, uh, you, you, if you, it's very, very liquid, you don't have to treat the future. Uh, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the training model, information symmetry literature, so futures is a very, very important market. You, you see there, so you, in addition to uh, this kind of hedging speculation, the basic functions, it also has another uh, function which is the price discovery. So there's a huge literature studying the kind of connection between equity market, uh, underlying market, and, uh, and the derivative market, so which information is discovered uh, um, uh, more quickly, all these kind of things. But in order to understand that, you have to think about the information asymmetry. So the, uh, I just want to say, so this is probably the, if you want to position the paper to a broader literature to think about why you want to introduce the futures, uh, so maybe it's beyond just about the transaction cost, this, this kind of thing. It also has the information asymmetry, this kind of additional things. And so in particular, I have a paper with uh, Itai Goldstein and Yan Li in 2014. So we, we, in our model, we found something very, very similar to the current model. We also have a he negative hedging ratio. So basically, if you have an investor, this person has uh, some uh, uh, larger trading opportunity. They can, can trade one asset, another asset. So that if he, he has speculated a lot on one particular asset, he might want to use the other asset to, to hedge. Uh, so this can also have a negative uh, uh, hedging ratio. So the, um, I, I think it's kind of very, very similar to the current paper in terms of the trading behavior. But if we focus more on the implications of uh, price efficiency and the market liquidity, 
it's a it's a different uh, focus. Uh, another co comment related to robustness. So now all players are big. So you can probably can think about those guys as an institutional investor, big institutional investors. But what if you have a fringe of small investors? I, I think probably if you think that it is a supposedly considered alternative model, you have any larger players and you have a, a fringe, a, a mass of small investors. That will kind of resume the competitive equilibrium outcome, I think. That's, a, that's probably the, 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 what was happening. Uh, uh, but that's probably closer to reality. I think probably in reality for each kind of each market, maybe you have a, a few large players and you have, also have some small players. Uh, so that, this, is, this is about the interpretation and the robustness result. The second one is the second comment about the welfare. Uh, so I, I like the welfare a, a lot, uh, the, the, the welfare result a lot. But the, the result sort of reminded me of the signal jamming model. Uh, so currently, so this, it's like a, if you introduce the futures, all players want to manipulate. But they, they, uh, they, they, because they, they offset each other, so they, their forces counter, uh, kind of uh, uh, counteract each other as a result of the price does not change, but they end up, they kind of start with a better outcome. So their, their, their welfare will be reduced. This is kind of very, very similar to the science model, the QJ paper. So the, the firms, also the firm managers want to uh, do some signal jamming thing and to manipulate the, the, the earnings and but the, uh, the market is not a food, uh, so that, that's the kind of similar. I think the, the, the result, the outcome, although people want to do that, it's kind of like a, from partial equilibrium perspective, it's in everyone's interest to do that better thing. But in equilibrium, it turns out it's better for everyone. Uh, so I have a recent paper with Hao Xiang in review as a present study. So what, what we do is we think about the un, uninformed the bigger players. They try to oversell their assets and to manipulate or deceive the regulators so that the regulators can intervene the market to, 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 to do some kind of bailout to help those uh, uninformed people. But in, in equilibrium, these uninformed people are, are harmed actually. And it's also signal jamming uh, model. So that's kind of the, the, the that, that, that is, I'm not sure whether there's some connection. I think it's probably this is general for all these kind of types of models. Uh, the, another question related to the kill traders. The kill traders is very much like the, and all the traders in the information model. So if you think about the welfare, so those, those people are new, newcomers. So we don't know how to think about their, their welfare. Uh, I, I know you, you think about it, uh, you, you have a small little section talk about that, but I think it's kind of, it's probably better to think about the, you have a more complete analysis to think about the welfare of those people. So those people might be risk averse, uh, risk averse hydrants and what will be their welfare. And I will talk about this later in the next slide too, about the kill traders. And also the size of kill traders it is related to N. So this is, uh, if you increase the number of N, make the model kind of competitive. So those, uh, um, the kill traders will also, the, the size will also increase. And then you have to interpret this. Right? this is, uh, if you, you interpret this asset as an um, equity market, or to think about this as a India sync credit stock. And it, I think about the, if, if, you, if you, you have a single stock or a single commodity, so this assumption might not be very relevant. So it might be some kind of, if you think like something like a diversification, it might be have this end disappear. So this, uh, the, the, that, that's uh, so, uh, about the interpretation of this asset. Now I think about this Q um, back in the next slide. So I think about what, what is exactly driving this, uh, and then what, what the result is exactly related to Q. So you have two shocks. One is the fundamental news, epsilon, uh, epsilon one, and the other one is the supply shock of Q. Um, I think it probably it's better to think about the interaction between them. And I think about the which, which result is really driven by each element. And when I read the, 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 the proposition uh, or the formal results, sometimes I think, uh, I think that I see that the results have a different assumption. For example, for lemma one, you assume this Q is small, but in proposition five, you assume this Q is large, uh, all relative to epsilon one. So it, all relative to epsilon one. Um, so this, those, this, this means this across those uh, uh, formal results, uh, you, you have different conditions. I'm not sure whether those, those conditions kind of uh, reconcile with each other. So whether if you think about all the results, the better you have a non-empty set of parameters for all results to hold, something like that. Maybe you, you think about some benchmark setting that just with one shock um, and it, to highlight more about the interaction between epsilon one and the Q. So, so whether you really need two shocks 
uh, to think harder to whether you just need the Q or just need the epsilon one. Uh, so that, that, that's an, uh, another set of comments. And I, I finally have a, a, a comment about organization. I think the paper is, is great, has a lot of results. Uh, it's very, very rich in, in theory. And also it had a section in seven talking about empirical prediction. Um, but I, I think it's, um, if you think about paper, whether the paper is a pure theory paper, so the currently it's written more like a pure theory paper. Think about the, what's the bigger rule of adding future the market. Oh, but if you think about it as an applied theory paper, if it's an applied theory paper, probably you need to strengthen two parts. One is about the, some, some positive applications, uh, implications. Of, think about what, what empirical puzzles or regularities that your model can explain. Uh, so that, uh, this is not about prediction. Prediction is something new people can take your model to, to the data. So the, this, is, this one is more about something people struggle uh, to explain. That your model can help people to understand that. Uh, so you talk about this basis thing, the, the basis, non-zero basis, you call this as an um, arbitrary opportunity. I think it's probably a mislabeling. So, so this is the equilibrium outcome that cannot be arbitrary opportunities, opportunities in the in, in equilibrium. Uh, alternatively, you can also try to think about normative implication. I think you, you, you are fully aware of this because you, you mentioned a lot of these kind of things about the regulation, uh, you know, manipulation, all these kind of things. That, br that brings me to that another comment about the manipulation. I, I think the manipulation, uh, I also do some theory, uh, game theory things. I think manipulation, we often use that in, in, in our theory setting. Think about the, those uh, uh, player one, the, 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 the first mover will manipulate the belief or actions of the follower. So that's what we use in theory as a theory. But I think that that, that that continuation is a very negative, right? If you think about the regulators, regulators will think a manipulation is bad. They want to ban that. It's very hard to, to imagine that in futures market, all the treatings are manipulative from the definition, according to the definition of regulators. Uh, so I, I think that from the perspective of regulators, so this, um, this is, uh, manipulation definition is very elusive. So for example, I, I uh, I, I searched the uh, one definition from Investopedia. It said the market manipulation is the act of artificially inflating or deflating the price of a security or otherwise inflating the, the behavior of the market. But this artificially is very subjective. So how, how do you mean, but how do you define artificially? It's more like a circular. So you, you have to think about what's genuine relative in order to define artificial. It is, uh, it's not easy to define it, manipulation. If you, if you try to bring the model result directly to the uh, regulation implication, I think it's not very easy. So, so the manipulation you use you, in a word uh, is the, the word in game theory. So in, in theory, I think it probably is a, a neutral uh, word that should be influenced, right? If you think about the regulator, it might be influenced, it might be better. And uh, Peter Kyle and, and we should have a paper in AR 2008. So they also try to give a formal definition of what do we mean by illegal price manipulation. So according to their definition, it's more about the economic efficiency. So from two ways, either, so if that bad behavior can destroy uh, uh, resource allocation or can make the market less liquid. So the, the, the current model is an is a exchange model, is a no production, but you can think about the welfare. Um, but you can, but you, 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 you already talked about that welfare, but you can also probably think about the market liquidity, right? If you, you can connect the liquidity and the welfare uh, to the trading behavior of those, uh, uh, those bigger players, then you probably can use, use the Peter and the Vish the definition of manipulation to link your results to regulators' uh, the, uh, implication, the regulators' the regulation uh, purpose. Right, so all in, in, the, in, the, in, the writing, in the writing, you might use the inference as a kind of more neutral word to think about this. So overall, I think this is a great paper with a very, very clean model and a lot of results. Uh, but I think the paper can benefit by thinking about the better interpretation and the applications, and it can probably be more focused and think about the, 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 the rules of epsilon one shock and the Q shock. Thank you very much.